Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks all over the country. On Sunday, March 24th, happy spring 2019. This is episode 1577. Enjoy. Well, good day, mate. It's time for the Tech Guy, the show where we cover the latest news from Silicon Valley. Yeah, computers, the internet. Home theater, we covered digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches. This is the place if you want to talk high tech. I'm here to do it with you. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, outside that area. You still call free if you use Skype out, something like that. 888-827-5536. Website, Tech Guy labs.com and i give you that right up front because as you're listening if you hear me say something you say oh i, I gotta make a note of that no you don't we have uh, we have people to do that for you transcriptionists james ruvo is writing it down as we speak techguylabs.com is free there's no sign up there's no subscription you just can go there and not only find the answers uh, to the questions on the show and links to the websites i mentioned but also if you go there you can uh, leave your own comments and thoughts. So if I get something wrong, you can don't shout at the radio, just shout at the website, techguylabs.com. We have a chat room that's always going on during the show at irc.twit.tv. Those are the most engaged and brilliant members of the audience who have gone in to uh, help you with your computer woes, your problems, and to talk about Pokemon Go. It is irc.twit and whatever else is on their mind, irc.twit.tv. TV. I think this is good, but the Electronic Frontier Foundation and other digital libertarians think it's bad. L.A., the city of Los Angeles, has decided that they're going to allow scooters on the streets of L.A., but they're going to have a requirement. The L.A. Department of Transportation says it's going to require all scooter companies to provide location data on the vehicles. For a couple of reasons. One, to know where they're <laughs> clustered, making a mess of things. Because if you've seen the scooters, have you been to have you been to uh, Santa Monica and seen the scooters just littering the streets like that? So that's helpful. But also for city planning purposes, the way it works is LA DOT will get anonymized information after the trip is completed within 24 hours. It doesn't include name, age, gender, address of the user, anything like that. Just the start trip and end trip of every vehicle to make sure scooters are being parked legally with the, in the terms of the permit. But privacy advocacy groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Center for Technology and Democracy say they shouldn't get this kind of data. This is a big battle going on in Canada right now, in Toronto. Google has a little affiliate called Sidewalk Labs, and they're, try they're taking it over an old, uh, I think it was a rail yard, it's kind of empty uh, land in Toronto, to create a smart city. Uh, and I, it's kind of interesting, I think, because they're using the data generated by the city to figure out, you know, I don't know, all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, traffic patterns. It's called Sidewalk Toronto. Actually, you can, you can read more about it at sidewalktoronto.ca. But there's also a lot of upset over this, saying, well, we don't want Google to know anything about us. Uh, this is the constant tension in Silicon Valley, and even, in fact, among the nerds I know, and I include myself, is this balance between the m amazing things that can be done with data, many of them very valuable. Think about the, the medical data generated by things like the Apple Watch, and then the legitimate concerns of people who say, yeah, but I don't want my data... Not my backyard. It's the same. It's the same. It's it's a data version of NIMBY. I don't want my data to be used for that. And yet, your data is incredibly valuable if it can be properly anonymized. And we know that's also a challenge. That uh, it's easy to, or can be easy to, de-anonymize data. But I hate for our um, kind of 
overwhelming desire for privacy to get in the way of things that could imagine a smart city you know uh, uh things you could do with a smart city because you know where people congregate where traffic is you can you can have true democracy people can participate in the government electronically there's some real opportunity there and i know things can go wrong i mean one of the problems we geeks have is we get all excited about stuff like we were about the internet and Twitter and Facebook and oh, think of the things, all the things you can do. And we often forget to look at the dark side and the negatives and the bad things it might enable. But that's human nature. It's certainly geek nature. And I, I'd hate for, you know, privacy advocates to say, I mean, what's the harm if it's anonymized data? Shouldn't the city demand to know where those scooters are and what they're doing? The, the way LA Dot's going to do it, and I think there should be some oversight. I mean, for instance, LA Dot hasn't said how long they'll keep the data and, and what people can do with the data and so forth. But so we need to know that. And there need to be some, some oversight. I, I agree with that. But the way they want to do it is if you want a permit to have a scooter operating in Los Angeles, uh, you're going to get a longer permit if you agree to hand over the GPS data. You can still do it, but it'll only be a 30-day permit. You'll have to renew every 30 days. And if you don't want to share the data, uh, you only get 3,000 scooters. Share the data, and you get 10,000 scooters over the next year. So that LA residents are actually three times more likely to be riding a scooter that gives data to LA Dot, Lyft and Uber both run scooters scooter systems, they don't want to give the data to LA. And I don't think it's for, out of any privacy concern. I think it's because they want the data uniquely, exclusively for themselves. Lime and Spin will give their data. So I guess if you want to use a scooter anonymously, <laughs> look for the Lyft and Uber scooters. Uber also has a, a bike thing. I rode those the, uh, the other day in uh, Santa Monica. It was so, it was so cool. It was so cool. They're electric bikes. You just put your, you know, put your phone up against it. They're not cheap. I wish they were a little cheaper. They're, but you know, they, I understand. And you can, and the nice thing is, you can bicycle somewhere and just leave it there. It's a one-way trip. LA wants to also collect data on ride shares, Lyft and Uber's cars. And we know Uber does this. <laughs> Uber got in trouble because they had something called God Mode where they could see where everybody in by name was in their cars. They also had a program called Gray Ball that avoided governmental enforcement agencies, law enforcement and government agencies, and made sure that Uber didn't pick them up because they didn't want to get in trouble. So Uber is not hesitant to use this data. <laughs> they just don't want the city to have it. Big day tomorrow. We're going to find out what Apple's up to. Uh, this is, as some have said, this is the day. Tomorrow's the day that will mark the 25th, the transition of Apple from a hardware company making phones and computers and tablets to a services company selling TV and magazines and newspapers, renting them to you. A paid news service, in effect. And it's a fascinating story. We don't, I think we know an awful lot about what Apple will announce tomorrow. It's expected they'll announce a new news service, $10 a month news service. It'll give you magazines and some, not all, newspapers. The rumor is the Wall Street Journal will be in it, but not the New York Times or the Washington Post. Local papers really have less incentive to participate than national magazines. That they'll do a TV service, which at least for now is mostly just a unified place where you can get your HBO, your Showtime, your stars, and then eventually Apple will start to release. They have a number of homemade programs, original programming, they'll start to release some pretty good or pretty interesting stuff anyway. I don't know if it's good yet. And then possibly a third game service where you pay a flat fee per month to play not freemium games, but paid games and that the developers will get a payment based on the amount of time you spend playing the game. None of that to me is very exciting, but it is to Apple because iPhone sales are way down. And they're desperately trying to find a new revenue uh, stream. And they think services are going to be it. Those are some of the stories caught my eye this week. We're going to get to your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO. Let's talk about what's on your mind. She's unbreakable. It's a miracle. 
Our little Kimmy Schaffer's here. She don't take no Schaffer. Hello. I feel like that song's appropriate because I'm feeling a little broken. Why are you broken? Because technology is a pain in the butt. Oh, that. <laughs> We're all a little broken um, when it comes to technology. I hate how getting tickets to any event now are digitally. Yeah. And they force you to first set up an account with Ticketmaster. Yeah. And then download yeah. their individual app. And yeah. Yeah. You know what I hate? At the end of the process when they say, and here's your $45 ticket fee right. for There's a $35 ticket. Right. That makes and me so angry. And they're transferring tickets from you, one person to another. Do? Yeah, I know. That never works. And like, I don't want all four tickets on my friend's phone because how am I going right. to get in and out? Like, ah! I driving went, me nuts. We went to a big Broadway show, the Harry Potter show, uh, a couple of months ago, and I had to buy tickets on Ticketmaster. Mm -hmm. You can't use paper tickets, I guess, because they're worried about... Right. Counterfeiting. Counterfeit. I get it. I get it. But it's so, strange. But then I couldn't send Lisa her ticket. And then I tried to do it, and we couldn't get in. <laughs> so what did we have to do? We had to go around the corner back to the box office. The show's about to begin in 10 minutes to get paper tickets printed. Yeah, and my friend is now freaking out on the phone on me because she's seeing only one yeah. ticket in her wallet when so I sent annoying. her two tickets. So, so annoying. I, yeah. So I'm, Well, now I, I know why you're broken. I'm broken today. Kim Schaffer is, I, I don't know why she's today. doing that. You're supposed to be answering calls, Kim. I did that too. Oh, okay. I'm very Don't good. make me be your boss. I'm being, being <laughs> very good at multitasking. <laughs> yeah, no. There's not that. Honestly, there's not that much to do. We have great callers. They yeah. call in. We put them on the air. In fact, let's let's demo. Let's show the people how great our callers are. Who should I start with? Uh, how about John in Burlington, Canada, wanting to convert an old Windows laptop into a Chromebook? Oh. And can he do that? Can he break is it? That, is that possible? That's a great question. Thank you, Kimmy Schaffer. Unbreakable. I love your new theme song. <laughs> Unbreakable. It, uh, hello, John in Berlin Game. Thank you, Kim. Hello, John. Hi, Leo hi, Laporte, hi. the tech guy. Hello. Come on over to the phone, John. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're kind of on speakerphone, though. You kind of sound like you're in a mine shaft. Are you there? I'm on, I'm on my uh, mini. Ah, uh, that's all right. Mini. Just get closer to your mini. What can I do for you today? I have a uh, an old Windows laptop that I want to convert over to a uh, Chromebook if it's possible. It might be possible. It's uh, so Chrome OS, which is the operating system on the Chromebook, uh, is an open source project, uh, Chromium OS, and so it, you know that means you could, in theory, take the code and and put it on anything. There's a commercial entity that I would start with called Neverware. And they have Chrome OS. They call it Cloud Ready, but it's Chrome OS, and it does everything Chrome OS does. And I think it's primarily schools that they uh, want this to go to because schools are often turning old, beat-up Windows machines into nice new Chromebooks. So I would go to Neverware.com and look at their hardware compatibility list. My experience has been, however, that not everything works with it. It is possible... To do it yourself as well. I don't think I don't know if Neverware charges. I feel like it doesn't for, you know, a onesie twosie operation. But there are other ways to do it. There's something called Chromify, which um, will help you install Chrome OS on an old laptop. And the other place you can go and get some really good information, as usual, anything having to do with Android, and I guess now Chrome OS as well, I go to XDA Developers, and I've referred to this site before, xda-developers.com, and they say you can install Chrome OS on any non-Chromebook PC or tablet, and they have a step-by-step -step on how to do it. I'll put that in the show notes um, so you can refer to it, because I'm not going to walk you through it on the air. That would be the height of uninteresting radio. But if you go to the article, you can see how to do it. And this, you know, if you think about it, Chrome OS is a Linux. We've talked about Linux before, the free operating system that people often put on old PCs as a way to revitalize them. You know, Microsoft in January is going to stop updating Windows 7. They did the same with Windows XP and Windows Vista some years ago. And that's just, you know, that's this the march of time. I think it's a 10-year lifespan, some close to that. Depends on the Microsoft's whim. And after that, they just say, well, you're on your own now. We can't be bothered. And it's unsafe, really, to keep using Windows 7 if they're not going to patch it. 
So a lot of people with Windows 7 laptops are probably looking at things to do. We always say, hey, try Linux. It's free. You can install it. Usually installs very easily on older PCs and runs better, frankly, than Windows does. And uh, is being kept up to date. It's secure. It's just not Windows, so it's harder to use. You may not understand some of the features of it, and you can't run some of your Windows software. Uh, but there's, in most cases, Linux analogs for everything. Chrome OS is an even more locked-down version of Linux that Google made for their Chromebooks. And it's a little more finicky in terms of hardware than even Linux itself. So if you can't get Chrome OS on it, then, then go to ubuntu.com uh, or, you know, you can search other Linux distributions. A distribution is just basically a rolled-up way of making a Linux operating system. Uh, Ubuntu is very popular. U-B-U-N-T-U, probably .org, not com, but U-B-U-N-T-U. And you can, if you can't install Chrome OS, you can install something much like it. Uh, a, a Linux version called Ubuntu. Robert, Glendale, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Robert. Yes, Leo, I've been uh, rendered obsolete by Microsoft. I've, oh, I've no. been using Windows 7. Yes. And I've had to move to Windows 10 with the ribbon system. Yes. And uh, it stopped me dead in my tracks. Oh, you're talking about the uh, Office suite? Well, both the... Uh, you don't like the new menus on uh, Windows yeah. 10, and then, of course, Office has this ribbon system. I can't do anything uh, fast. So it's muscle memory. You'll you can relearn it. Um, this is this is you know honestly this is my problem with Microsoft sunsetting Windows Seven is it's a Windows Seven was probably the best version of Windows ever, and uh, people know it. And why should we have to change? But Microsoft's point of view is well, we we don't want to have to maintain it. We don't want to have to keep it programmers involved in all of that. You could stick with Windows Seven for a while. Here's what. I hope people did. Back in a couple of years ago when Windows 10 came out, Microsoft offered a free upgrade to Windows 10. And my suggestion at the time was upgrade, because if you don't like it, there's a button within 30 days you can downgrade back to Windows 7. But once you've done that, once you've installed Windows 10 on any machine and it's been authorized, then at any time, at any later date, like next year, like January, you can go back to Windows 10. I'd say try it. Give it a chance your muscle memory has to relearn, but it's still Windows, fundamentally. Uh, I understand you have an aversion to the way it looks, but you'll get used to it, just as you got used to Windows 7 and Office and all that stuff. It just takes a little time. I think Windows 10 is great, and it is the future of Windows. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Sam Abul Samid, he is principal researcher at Navigant Research. He's our car guy, an expert in automotive stuff. Hi, Sam. Hi, Leo. Back in Great Detroit. Back it again. was nice to have you in studio the other day, but he's back in Detroit, the Motor City. Yeah, it was fun to be in the studio uh, last week and also uh, to do Twit afterwards with, uh, yeah. with Ian and Matt. That and was, you that drove was a great that show. Uh, Kia Nero up to, uh, and of course spent some more time with it. Did you, your your final uh, thoughts on it? Was it good? Did I, you enjoy yeah, it? Yeah, I, I like it a lot. I think it's it's absolutely a great option for anybody that's looking for a more affordable EV that's got... Um, it's got plenty of range. It's got uh, it's EPA rated at about 239 miles of range. So it's, you know, it's got enough range to be a realistic, you know, primary vehicle for, you know, pretty much any, you know, uh, any smaller family. Uh, you know, it's got enough room for four adults in there, room for some some cargo in the back, you know, you can put four uh, four roller board, roller board bags in the back. Um, and, you know, if you fold down the back seat, you have even more cargo space, you know, just like any other compact crossover. Boy, I, I saw somewhere uh, that it, it looks like electric vehicles in the next maybe five or six years will become as economical, maybe even more so than gas vehicles, that, that, that we're really about to cross that, uh, that point where EVs are even more common. And that brings yeah. up an issue. <laughs> yes, it, it does. Uh, an, an issue because it was I really fun for me to have a Tesla when there were no other electric vehicle owners on the road. I could yeah, pull up well, at the airport and front row parking, plug in and charge. Now I'm competing with a lot of other people. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is a problem that Tesla, you know, encountered a while ago. Just because you know they they have they've sold more vehicles, especially in California, than any other uh, EV maker. Um, and that is, you know, kind of the problem of EV charging etiquette. 
uh, which I'd like to talk a little bit about today. Please, you know, I beg of so, you. So, yes, you know, with 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 old fashioned gas and diesel cars, you know, it's not it hasn't really been a problem. You know, you it, even, yeah, because you even had if there was a lineup on yeah, a holiday pull, weekend. Yeah, you pull up and the, there's an, yeah. a line, and everybody knows what yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah, you get it. You know, you 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 fuel it. You know, you you put the nozzle in, fill it up in five minutes, and you're on your way. And it, it's not a big deal. You don't usually end up waiting around, and certainly you don't end up parking next to the gas pump for any extended no. period of time. Yeah. And and even if you wanted to go into the convenience store and, and pick up something to drink or a snack, you know, after you're done pumping your gas, you pull around to the side and, and you park over there and let the next person pull up to the pump. No yeah. problem. No problem. But but it seems that um, some EV users, and, and I encountered this in, in San Jose this week after I left the studio, um, some EV users seem to think that it's okay to park next to a charger. No, um, no, and, and that's, no. that's not okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, te Tesla have found this with their superchargers, you know, over the last several years, you know, as they got more and more vehicles, more and more Tesla vehicles on the road, they found that people would park the car at the supercharger, you know, plug it in and then go off and, and do something else for a while because, you know, it's got to sit there for a half hour, 45 minutes, whatever to top yeah, but off. But not two hours, not five right. hours. And then, you know, people were waiting while these cars were sitting there. They yeah. were done charging, but they couldn't move them. Yeah. Uh, and so Tesla actually started charging people. Um, you know, once once your car finishes charging, you have like, a I think, about a five minute grace period at most. And the Tesla and, app, which you should have if you have a Tesla vehicle, mm -hmm. will say you're almost charged. You're charged. Yeah. OK, the clock's ticking. Get back over to your car. And I've never had a problem uh, leaving it there. But let me ask you a question. Uh, the other day I parked at the Oakland airport and mm -hmm. they had front row parking for EVs and I plugged it in. But I knew I was going to be gone for three days. The car would be fully charged. What am I supposed to do at the airport? I'm 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 somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, can I leave it there? Kind of, that I mean, that's kind of a problematic one. You know, I think because of the way airports have set that up, you, you probably don't really have a choice. I don't have a choice. If you, need, if you need to charge, you know, while you're away, I mean, if you get yeah. to the airport and you don't have yeah. enough charge to get home, then yeah, you you you've got to do that. So I I'm sorry, I I, I wouldn't do it for a three week trip. But right. I was I was using that space for three days, but somebody else could have used it. They have quite a few. And it and, sure is nice but, when you're getting off the plane and your car's in the front row parking. I do like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And But what's worse is what I encountered uh, this week in, in San Jose, which is, you know, there's a Whole Foods store there uh, not far away from where I was staying that has an EVgo station. They have five charging stations. Four of them are DC fast charging station chargers. Great. No problem. Except. I pull up to, to plug in the car and, and charge it up, and the two cars on either side of me are sitting there, and they weren't even plugged in. They were there was a, you know, two two it's different plug-in vehicles. Parking place. Right. It's not next to us were the handicap spots. I mean, those are there right next to the store because you know people that that need to use those. You know, they they want to give them easier access to the store. Perfectly legitimate. If you have an EV and you know you're if you're not parking in a parking space. If you're not going to charge it, do not park in front of a charger. <laughs> Thank you. Because there are people that actually that need, need to use those electricity. chargers. Yes. And, you know, later on, you know, I came back another time and, you know, the, all five spots were taken, but only three of the cars were plugged in. So it's one thing if you plug it in and you just haven't come back yet. You know, I mean, that's, you know, you should be pretty much every EV now has an app available that will give you right. alerts, you know, when you're done charging and you right. can go and unplug it with the car. But if all you're doing is if all you want is just a, a parking space close to the door, please don't go park somewhere else. <laughs> and, and, and of course, there's been a revolt across the United States by gas car users against electric vehicles. And you'll yeah, see well, often that's, pickup that's trucks. Absolutely dumb and rude. You'll I mean, those, those see guys them parked you know, in front of superchargers sideways yeah. to block as many as possible. And, uh, and those are probably the same guys that are rolling coal. Or, you know, yeah, they modify their right. diesel trucks, you know, to just spew up big clouds of black smoke. And, you know, police should really need to crack down on those guys. Yeah, I, I never Texas, understand you know. that. Now, uh, <laughs> last week you talked about uh, something that's coming or is on Mercedes now, this what three words yeah. navigation uh, system. Yeah, we, we talked about that previously. And so this, just as a reminder, this is a system that instead of using a street address, you know, you've got this company, What Three Words, that has developed a system that they apply a, a, a 10 by 10 foot grid to the entire planet. And so every 10 by 10 foot grid has three words assigned to it uh, as as your address. So because there's a lot of places in the world where 
um, street addresses are not very consistent or, uh, you know, they, they don't always match up with where the door actually is. Um, you know, or there may be a place like a stadium that might have multiple entryways and you want to tell somebody where you, you know, where to meet or where to get picked up. And so this, this system of what three words makes it really easy to find a much, to give a much more precise location. And Ford at MWC a few weeks ago announced that they were going to add what three words support through oh, their, nice. uh, you know, through sync app link. And last year, Mercedes uh, Benz was the first brand to actually integrate it into their infotainment system. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover is also adding it now. Um, and but I hadn't had a chance to actually try it out. Um, you know, and one of the the one flaw in the whole what three words exp experience is it, you have to know the three words for the place you want to go to. <laughs> well, if you want to visit us, it's Glow Walnut Nasal. We'll right. take you so right to our front. Walnut wit nasal into the What Three Words app, and it'll take you to the precise location of the front D door. Does it do that on a Mercedes? What do you do? On the, you'd speak into the Mercedes and say, Glow? Yeah, you, you just say, hey, Mercedes, because their, their new system you know, has a digital assistant system built into it. And it's got the, the you know, so sorry if you're listening to this in your new Mercedes A-Class. <laughs> um, but, you know, just you, just, you say, hey, Mercedes, uh, if you have the MBUX infotainment system and say, you know, Glow nasal was a glow nasal. L navigate to glow walnut nasal. Yeah, na navigate to glow walnut. Now nasal. get it right because if you and get it in the wrong order, you're gonna end up in Antarctica or somewhere. So. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> and then it'll it'll guide you directly there. It'll 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 take those three words and translate it to the specific the location. The theory is it's easier to remember words than uh, than uh, GPS coordinates. I love it. Yeah, but, but, how, but how many people even remember it? Phone no, numbers. They're gonna think now. you're nuts. Glow yeah. walnut. Hey, so, uh, Sam will boost them in. Thank you so much, the car guy, principal researcher at Navigant Research. We'll talk again next week and. Mind your P's and Q's at the Charger, will you? Twisted Mister in our chat room says, I wish people would learn the rules. You can't drive and park like a rude person unless you have a BMW. That's the <laughs> law. Yes. But there are plug-in BMWs now, so you could take one of those and park <laughs> it in front of the Charger and not plug it in. It, is, it, is it a uh, myth that BMW drivers are rude? I think it's true. Uh, I I think it, it's you know like like all myths Entitled. you know there 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 there's is a kernel a, of truth there's a, in there's it. a kernel of truth there you know that <laughs> of course you know as any other stereotype has yeah. has been exaggerated that's and why the, the guys on Top Gear really helped to <laughs> you know extrapolate that over the years that's why I drive an Audi because <laughs> nobody has that perception of Audis like oh Audi drivers are so snooty or rude. But see, that's, and maybe I won't get that Porsche Taycan after all. Maybe I'll just get an Audi because Porsche drivers are also <laughs> entitled, right? <laughs> I, it, it's been that's been said about just about anybody. Any luxury vehicle, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So. I'm sure they think that when I drive my Tesla around. Oh, you're no, a rude Tesla driver. Yeah. Oh, only when you leave it parked in front of a somebody else's charging station. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I didn't ask uh, Lisa whether what she thought. Of the, I think she liked the uh, Nero, but she didn't get to drive it. Uh, I think she'll probably will probably go to a dealer and, and try it. But you said and, and you said that Audis are out now. I think they are out like in next month, if not now. Uh, yeah, they the should e be available um, sometime in April or yeah, May. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. So I'll, I'll, I'll check. I'll check. This I don't know what I'll be check. driving. I think maybe I won't spend the money on a Taycan as much as I'd like to because I don't want to be that rude guy in the Porsche. Well, you don't have just because you drive one doesn't mean you have to be rude. You don't have to live up to the stereotype. I had a girlfriend who drove a BMW. She drove like a bat out of hell. Hey, there's people that drive all kinds of cars like bat out of hell. Yeah, so that's true. Is. That's true. Hey, Sam, always a pleasure. You're a great point about uh, Nvidia uh, GeForce Go. I will. Um, I'll mention that um, when we talk about Stadia next time. I did mention it briefly because I am a user. Uh, and of course, there've been you know there've been other uh, attempts at doing this. I don't think Google's is going to be particularly interesting in the long run, but we'll see. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see how they implement. You know, it's it's there's always the devils in the details. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Twist, uh, Twisted Mister says it takes about ten minutes behind the wheel in a BMW. You're driving like that. It's not you. It's the <laughs> car. I don't know. I've, I've driven lots of BMWs, and I I'd like to think that I have not behaved. I don't that think way. I've ever driven a BMW. I don't think so. My college roommate was all over the 2002s. Oh, those were great. They're really cute little cars yeah. and fun to drive. And then I, uh, Michael's friend, his first guy was 16. His, his dad uh, owns a BMW repair shop, and he's got a lime green 2002. 
that I Ooh. that's his car. I think he probably had to kind of build it up and fix it up to make it work. But hey, that's great. Isn't I mean, that great? You know, yeah, he knows all about it. it and, yeah, you know, got it restored and everything. What yeah. do you think of the Lexus LC five hundred? Lou wants to know. Lou M. I love the LC five hundred. Yeah, it is. A, it's a fantastic Grand Touring Coupe. It's fast and it's it's actually shockingly good on the track. I had a chance to drive one at Road America last spring. I drove one for I've driven them a couple of different times, but I got to drive one at the Road America racetrack in Wisconsin last year. And, you know, it's it's really good and it sounds fantastic. I've always been a Lexus fan. I just think those are the greatest cars. I kind of miss my old Lexus. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo, the tech guy phone number. <laughs> Back to the calls we go. George in Mexico City. Hello, George. Hi there, Leo. Hey, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Long time listener, never really called in. Well, it's about Calling time. Mexico City. Wonderful. Yeah, my friend Mike Elgin and his wife Amira are down there. They were there for New Year's. And they said it was a, they were they were at a, at a hotel on the Zocalo, and they said it was beautiful and fun. New Year's Eve in um, Mexico City is one heck of a party. As long as they get it when there is no election, <laughs> political manifestations tend to block the Socalo. Oh, no, that's no good. That's no, no. good. Listen, I'm calling you because I'm interested in Google Photos. Yes. Uh, some background. Um, I'm an Austrian national living in Mexico, but uh, I've been using Google Photos. Uh, in order to back up different uh, systems, like, for example, my laptop, my uh, phone, my iPad. But I'm getting problems with duplications. I get a lot of duplicated photos. Really? Oh, because you're doing... Yeah, you're backing it up from different locations. And you'd think Google Photos would be smart enough to say, oh, uh, that's the same photo. I get the same problem, but that's partly because I um, upload both uh, edited JPEGs and the originals, and Google Photos rightly says, well, those are two different versions. We're not going to decide which one to keep. We'll keep them both. Um, so I have had to go back through Google Photos and uh, delete uh, swaths of duplications. I don't know of any way to do that automatically. Well, that's where I'm prone, because I got more than 5,000 photos, and... I just don't want to delete them individually. Yeah, I don't blame you. I understand the Picasa used to have that option. Well, thank you, Google, for killing Picasa because they, they bought it and incorporated some of the features into Google+. And then as is, as is Google's want, they killed it and really didn't get all the features. And I don't think that's – I don't know of any, uh, any deduplication feature frankly, uh, in Google Photos. I, in fact, if somebody knows, please call us because uh, George and I want to know. <laughs> we, need, yeah. we need it. Yeah. My suggestion, what I ended up, I used, what I did was, and the reason I got uh -huh. duplicates is I would, uh, as I was traveling, I would do this on trips, use the phone. So I'd take pictures with my fancy camera and then pair it the, to the phone and copy them over kind of as a backup. And then I knew the phone was going to back it up to Google Photos. That made me happy because I knew I would have at least a kind of a JPEG version of all my images. There was no chance of losing images on my trip. Then when I got home, I'd copy the raw, high-quality photos onto my desktop, modify them in Lightroom and so forth. But Google Photos would then see them as different versions of the same photo and re-upload them. So I was getting two and sometimes three versions of the same photo on every trip. You know, I, I think using the sort features is great because Google Photos does know the date of capture. So you can use the search function to say, I want to see all the photos from this date and then manually uh, deduplicate it. But um, I don't know of any automated way. I think uh, I think this would be a, a great have ever, feature. Have you ever tried uh, closing Google Photos completely, eliminating everything and reloading everything yes. in order to avoid duplicates? Yes, I have done that, as a matter of fact. When I got a big ton of them from a trip uh, last year to Japan, I, I deleted everything. And I re-uploaded, and that was one way to do it. Um, and that that's harmless, you know. It just takes a while. And the nice thing about I always use the um, I always use the desktop uh, uploader because I want to get everything in there. I I guess my attitude is since it's unlimited free storage, so I've got some duplicates. It's not the end of the world. 
you're right that Picasso does have this feature, and it may be possible if you have it. You have an old version of Picasso lying around. Um, no, unfortunately not. Yeah, I was recommended Picasso, but I never used it. Yeah, me neither. I yeah, Google Photos. So that's that's all I have. Yeah. Um. I'm just looking so here. Thinking, well, if I if I take it down from my iPhone, from my iPad, from my laptop, and all the sources, delete yeah. the account, yes. establish an account. Yep. Because there are ways to de to upload to de everything again. Yes, exactly. There are ways to deduplicate on your desktop. So if you got every, if you kind of downloaded everything to your desktop, deduplicated erased everything in Google Photos, and then re-uploaded, which would take a little time, with, but, but not forever, uh, that would be probably the way to do it. Um, yeah, there are like 5,000 photos. Yeah, that won't take forever. Leave the laptop on. And yeah. The, and then Google we, Photos says we aren't going to sync, we're not going to sync identical photos. So mm -hmm. if you have duplicates, it, as it was in my case, it's because I had jpeg versions on google photos and then when i uploaded the raw photos the originals it said well these aren't the same so we're going to upload that as well so that was the real problem for me and i think it must be for you because google photos it says specifically no we will not duplicate but of course it doesn't know that it's not a duplicate it looks the same to you you know the photos were you know related but they aren't duplicates one's a jpeg and one's a original so I, you know, okay. there is no feature for the remover of duplicates in photos. So what you're going to have to do is something like you described. In my case, there are duplicates. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there is apparently. I'm looking now, and apparently there is some software that claims I wouldn't use it. That will it will uh, sweep Google Photos and find duplicates. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. On the other hand, if what you're going to do is erase everything and start over. You might try the dedupe software first and see if it does the job before you go through the more drastic measure of deleting everything and re-uploading it. Honestly, I think one of the things many photographers just lear learn to live with is duplicates. Because, you know, if you go and you take a photo and you change it, you modify it, change the white balance or you, you crop it or whatever, it's a different photo now and it's going to be duplicated. So you're going to have multiple versions of what you know is the same photo, but a computer says, well, no, they're not. You know, they're different. So as far as I know, there's I, there's no way to do it automatically, but there are ways to do it manually. And you described the one I've used before, which is start over. It's just that's a, that's a lot of work. I'm not sure I, I would recommend it. Hey, nice to know you listen uh, in Mexico City, George. Thank you. We're going to visit uh, your homeland of Austria uh, next year. We're uh, we're gonna go back to Vienna. Boy, that's a beautiful town, and the and the Melk Abbey. Love two beautiful places, George. You have good taste. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo the phone number. If you have a good idea for George and me, because I have this problem too about deleting photos uh, that are duplicated in Google Photos, you can go to the website techguylabs.com and leave a comment there. I'd appreciate it. That would be very helpful. And if you've used a third party program that does this and you've used it successfully. That would be great to mention that. And actually, if you used it unsuccessfully, mention that too. This didn't work. Don't do this. It's, it's, I think photographers understand that we're just going to have duplicates. And when storage is unlimited and free, as it is on Google Photos, we just kinda, I just kind of say, well, that's what are you going to do? That's life. We talked a little bit on the last show about Google's big announcement this week, Google Stadia. This is a, a streaming game service. Google's late to the party on this, really. There have been a number of streaming game services. The idea is you don't have to have big, fancy gaming hardware to play high-end video games. Uh, they have the hardware on their servers. The game is played there and streamed down to your low-end device. As low, I mean, of course, a phone, but a tablet, uh, but even as low as a, a Google Chromecast Ultra, one of their little $80 dongles has five uh, 4k video and hdr you plug that into your tv and you could then play a game with that a high-end game with that that seems like a great idea doesn't it and i guess they would have some monthly fee the reason i say they're late to the party is because this has been going on for 10 years at least there was a company called on live that tried this the problem was they were just a little startup and what they found was there'd be busy times 
And so they need to buy, and this is actually an interesting problem for a lot of companies. They need to buy enough servers to handle the peak periods, but then a lot of that hardware would go unused during the slow times. And they really couldn't afford to have, they were too successful. They couldn't afford to have enough hardware to make it work. They ended up getting uh, picked up by, I think, Sony. Sony bought another company called Gaikai, did the same thing. Sony plans to do a streaming gaming service. So does Microsoft. So now Google enters the fray. There must be something in it. They must figure, well, see, I think if you're a gamer and you're listening to this, you're going, well, I don't want that. If you have an Xbox or a PlayStation or a fancy PC designed to play games, you, you, your natural reaction is, well, I don't need that. It's never going to be as good as what I've got. Google said, oh, no, no, it's going to be better than an Xbox uh, One X or a PlayStation 4 Pro because it's going to have a faster graphics card. Yeah, that's true. But the problem is that faster machine is up there in the cloud, way over there. And you know who's in between me and that machine? Comcast or Verizon or AT&T or Cox or Frontier, one of those one of those Internet service providers we love so very dearly. And boy, what an opportunity for them, right? No net neutrality means, hey, you want to play games on Google Stadia? That'll be a buck fifty extra. Of course it will, because it's oh, it's a lot of work for us to provide you with all that bandwidth. And if you don't have if you don't have good internet access, I mean really good, I mean really good internet access, these games will be unplayable. Google also did not announce price or availability, except to say. We're going to do it sometime this year. So, oh, excuse me if I yawn. Uh, okay, Google, let me know when you come to the party. We'll talk then. Oh, I shouldn't have said, okay, you know who? I woke up my phone. I <laughs> Never mind. Forget I mentioned it. Pwn to Own is ongoing right now in Vancouver. This is a really interesting event every year where... Uh, hackers come to the event. It's a hacking conference, CanSec West, and they and they all year long they've been storing up hacks for major operating systems and programs, even things like Teslas. They've been keeping them to themselves because there's a lot of money to be made if you. It's a competition if you can hack these devices. Yesterday, uh, hackers day two of Pondone took down. Mozilla, Firefox, and Microsoft Edge browsers. Actually, that was Thursday. Uh, so just so you understand this, what, what they do at the Pwn to Own conference is they put a standard install of whatever it is you're going to hack, um, maybe um, Windows or Mac or, or Chrome OS or a program or whatever, and then they say, go ahead, hackers, you have one hour to break in. And uh, they did. <laughs> Uh, into the two of the big browsers out there, which everybody claims are secure. Tesla got hacked. Um, there's a team called Fluoroacetate that really is good at this stuff, and they've made lots of money. They got fifty thousand dollars for hacking Firefox. That's why they save these all year long. So far this year, Fluoroacetate has earned. Get ready for this: three hundred forty thousand dollars. In the Pwn to Own conference. $340,000. This is their full-time job all year long. The, the team at Fluoroacetate works to find bugs. Now, the reason that this is okay, because it doesn't sound okay, does it? The reason this is okay is because after the competition, all of the flaws are given to the companies, not to the public, but to the companies that make these programs so they can fix them. So the companies actually don't mind this. This is, uh, this is a good thing for them because really, in fact, there's a whole ecosystem of uh, payments for hackers to find bugs. A lot, of, a lot of security professionals make their living doing this. The Tesla was hacked uh, on Friday, a Model 3, a team of security researchers, fluoroacetate, once again, hacked the Tesla car via... It's browser. Browsers are a great place to attack. Uh, I'll just read you the play-by-play. -play. 
They used a JIT bug, that stands for just in time, in the browser renderer process to execute code on the car's firmware and show a message on its entertainment system. See, that's not scary as much as if they made the car stop or were able to steal the car. Putting a message on the screen, big deal, I think. Team Fluoroacetate also found ex successful exploits in Apple's Safari. VMware Workstation and Windows 10. Of the total half million dollars awarded in the 3D comp three day competition, fluoroacetate got the lion's share. The final tally $375,000. And they got the Master of Pwn trophy. P W N. <laughs> Pwn. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I look forward to this every year, the Pwn to Own. And it's I'm sure that companies like Google and Apple and Mozilla and Tesla don't kind of it seems kind of, you know, bad publicity when you when you're the one that gets hacked. But I think in the long run it's good for everybody cuz these hacks are, you know, now put in, given to the company so they can fix them. I don't see a hack of the Mac. I don't think they were able to get it in Mac OS 10 Mojave. So that would be that would be good news. They did get Safari, however, Apple's browser. So I guess in a way that's a that's useful because uh once you get Safari, you're in you're into the computer. Oracle's virtual box, they got they took them two tries, but they finally got that. It's fun to read the play-by-play. -play. You could really, you could turn it into a sporting event. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. Mike in San Diego. Hey, Mike. Hey, Leo. Bear with me on this. I need your help. Yes, sir. I'm here to help. I stand hey, ready. Uh, yes. Okay. This, this is from the, if it's don't broke, don't fix it department. Okay. So, so hey, I have a four and a half year old Dell. It's a good computer. It's an XPS. I got like twelve gig of RAM, but it came with Windows eight point one. Anything with it? Ugh. All I did was was when I got it, I went online, paid five bucks for this classic shell so it had the desktop. Yes. yes. So I'd like to update to Windows ten. And okay. what I don't understand is is that still available? Not the free Windows update. You have to pay for it now. Um, Although I hear conflicting stories. Okay. So I would try. <laughs> okay. You've got your Windows 8.1 serial number. Well, well, the thing is, is, is there is no key like like that's on the box. People say that. Look on the bottom of your Dell. Oh, the bottom. Yeah, the bottom of your Dell will have a sticker, a Windows sticker that'll have a key on it. Oh, okay. You do have a key. Okay. You need a key. But the good news Correct. is, you will never need it again because once, okay. if you can install Windows 10, either paid or free. Uh, okay. Once you install Windows 10 on any machine, this is an important point. Uh, you mm -hmm. never need a serial number again. They just assume, all right, you own it. Okay. And honestly, I would. I'll tell you why I would do okay. this. First of all, 8 and 8.1 were among the most reviled versions of Windows ever, right up there with yeah, Windows yeah. ME and Windows Vista. Now, you've been using it for four years. You're happy with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I just think it'd be safer to go to Windows 10. It would be. It would be. Yeah. So, um, they essentially what they did, uh, and the mistake they made with Windows 8 and 8 1 was they got all hot and bothered about the iPad and said, look, Microsoft said, let's make this a tablet operating system, even if it's yeah. not a tablet. Now, is your Dell a standard laptop or is it a convertible two in one, something like that? No, no, it, it's a huge desktop. Yeah. So there's, yeah. <laughs> there's no reason at all to have a tablet mode on that because uh, you're never going to use it. You probably don't even have a touch screen. So, Correct. So they forced us down everybody's throat, regardless of need. And yeah. there were a lot of weird tablet-focused things, like if yeah. you move your mouse to the lower right corner, that notifications thing slides out. And, yeah. you know, weird things. when you They'd have a full-screen menu, which nobody wants, even on a tablet. Nobody. So you were smart. You went to Stardock.com, and you got Classic yeah. Shell. Which makes it, you know, basically more... Basically, you did what Microsoft right. ended up doing in Windows 10, which was hiding away. There's still all those tablet features are there still, but they hid it away. The biggest difference between Windows 7 and 10 is the start menu has that tablet-y look on Windows 10 instead of just a yeah. list. And, and classic, by the way, classic uh, start menu uh, is a great way to make it the old way anyway, and that still works on Windows yeah. 10. So you already own that. Yeah. 
So um, I would try. Here's what I would try to do. Yeah. Um, if you go, if you Google Microsoft Media Windows 10 Media Creation Tool, you'll yeah. go to a site. Uh, it says uh, download and install Windows 10. You make a USB key with Windows 10 installer on it. This is a good yeah. thing. Everybody should do this anyway because it's good to have. Uh, and it will ask you for a serial number. I would try putting in your Windows 8.1 serial number. It, it, I have been told by a number of people that mm -hmm. you will be able to authenticate Windows 10 at no cost by okay. doing that. That was the old thing, but apparently Microsoft forgot to turn it off, or I don't know. It, and if it doesn't work for you, I, I can't remember what they charge. It's less than 100 okay. bucks, And okay. it, I think it's worthwhile. And here's the other reason you want. You know, Windows 7 is, is in January going out of life cycle uh eight and yeah. eight one will be you know a year or two after that microsoft says windows 10 is the last version of windows okay they're never going to do this again they're never going to say oh you don't have win you know everybody will have windows 10 and that'll be that you won't buy mm -hmm. windows anymore so you might as well get that machine to windows 10 because then then you're done and you get you'll get automatic updates forever well, but 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 what about Windows 11? 11's got to be better. There is not going to be a Windows 11. Microsoft <laughs> swears this. I know one better. <laughs> they swear, and I, you know, I'm starting to think it's true because this is re Microsoft has done an amazing thing. It's a whole new company. The old Microsoft made all of its money on Windows and Office. The new Microsoft doesn't even care anymore. They make they're planning, and I think so far this conversion's working on making all their money on the cloud. And ultimately, yeah. they want. They say, and Satya Nadella, their new CEO, new, he's been there five years, has said repeated times, we want to be wherever our users are. We aren't, we're, we're, you know, they put Linux on Windows 10. They're doing all sorts of crazy things that the old Microsoft never would have done. So I believe them. I, I think it's credible that they're not going to try to make money on Windows going forward. Okay. So get to Windows 10. You won't have to go through this, when's the end of life? Oh, I got to upgrade. You won't have to ever do that again. Okay, if you can put a link to the Medios Creation Tool so I know I'm not on some third party. Google site. it and you'll see it, it, it'll be at Microsoft.com slash a lot of stuff. That's where I am now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks, boss. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. And, le you know, let me know uh, if you can install it without having to pay for it. I think you should. And we'll put a link in the show notes. There's a great article on How To Geek uh, that we'll put up. Thank you, Mars. We're in our chat room. We're going to put that up in the show notes. All the ways you can still get Windows 10 for free. Microsoft, it was years ago, Microsoft, when 10 first came out, said if you're using 7 or 8.1, you, you'll you be able to upgrade for free. But that only went on for about a year, and then they said, okay, that's it. Except that they didn't. And there are all these other ways that you can do it. For instance, if you if you uh, are disabled in any way, if you're using accessibility tools of any way, they, they said upgrade. you can upgrade for free. There's lots of ways to do it. So once once you get to Windows 10, you know, what will happen, and some people don't like this. This is the negative. I might as well tell you the negative as well as the positive. You're going to have to take updates from now on. You'll be able to defer them, but not forever, maybe a month. It's unclear what Microsoft's long-term plan is. Uh, you know, businesses can defer forever or for a long time, but, but home users won't be able to defer Right now, you can't defer at all. Uh, they, I think they're going to start giving you a chance to defer for some weeks, maybe a month. But ultimately, you're going to have to take the updates. And that includes these big spring and fall updates that in the past have caused problems. So defer by all means, but if, at some point, you're going to have to install it. This is in lieu of new versions of Windows. They're just like the newest one, 1809. There'll be a uh, 190 or is the newest 1903? No, it's not out yet. It will be 1903 or what they're calling it right now is 19H1, first half of 2019. But that's getting that's real close to being finished. That means it probably starting next month, maybe in May, they'll start pushing that out, and we'll hear howls of pain because it'll break stuff. <laughs> You know, as much as Microsoft tests this stuff, not everything is perfect. And so defer it for a little bit, but take it when you can. Do not what you should not do. By the way, a new tip I never would have said before. Do not seek updates. I used to, and I think a lot of us would just, you know, hit Windows key I, click the update button and, the, and say, what do you got for me? What do you got for me? They, Microsoft now calls that being a seeker, <laughs> and they won't push 1809 out unless you seek it.
If you don't seek it, they'll push it much later. So so the new rule on Windows, this is weird, I wish I didn't have to say this, is don't look for updates. Just let Microsoft tell you when it's time. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's photo time with Chris Marquardt, our photo guru. Chris is a great photographer in his own right and a wonderful teacher. Leads expeditions all over the world doing photography at discoverthetopfloor.com. It's published a number of books, and I lo I'm loving your wide-angle book, which just came out. And, of course, there's a film book, too. Hello, Chris. Welcome to The Tech Guy. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being um, on. You post your photos online, don't you? I do. And you post them on Flickr, among other places. I do. I stopped using Instagram because I don't want to support Facebook. Plus, there's a lot of weirdness on Instagram. So now I use Flickr and SmugMug. So have you ever had a picture that you took in Flickr Explore? No, what's that? You know that? what that is? No, I, I've, only <laughs> been, well, I've only been using Flickr since 2005. I'm kind of new at this. What is Flickr Explore? Yeah, I've been I've been around about the same time. Yeah. I think I also started around 2005. <laughs> um, Explore is a part of Flickr <clears throat> that that sometimes picks out pictures oh. of the Flickr members and showcases them. It's a it's a public gallery that uh, showcases photos of Flickr users. And the moment you get a photo in Explore, your inbox will probably explode. Um, and it's kind of recently, a vote of confidence, right? That that means you you know you you're good. You have a great picture, and the people at Flickr have chosen. We should mention real quickly right. that Flickr used to be from Yahoo. Yahoo was not the best steward when Yahoo got sold to Verizon and became part of Oath. Verizon sold off Flickr to our my good friends at SmugMug, who are real photo buffs, and they are going to be great stewards of Flickr. So we have our photo guy. Uh, group on uh, on Flickr and I, I'm just thrilled that Flickr is going to be around for a lot longer to come. So you got a photo on Explore? I, I got a photo on Explore. Whoa. It doesn't happen every now and then. <clears throat> and it's it's interesting because you all of a sudden, I mean, you post photos and you po I, I post photos as often as I can, especially when I travel. And then a photo might get a few hundred views and maybe a couple of comments and some <laughs> likes. And I just recently posted one uh, from that Norway trip. Yeah. Um, you can see it at tfttf.com slash Aurora pick, oh, which is one of the Aurora photos yes. that I posted. Yes. And within a, within three days, it got 49,000 views, what? over 600 likes, 35 comments. It was, it was crazy. This, so, is, this is the peak. This is when you're so, at the, the top of your profession. It can't can't get better. <laughs> but of course, I'm I'm kind of, I'm a curious mind. So I was I, I went on a bit of a of a exploration research mission to kind of look behind what does that explore thing actually mean? How do you get on explore? And, um, and how do you uh, know you're on it? Do they send you a note? Well, you know because you receive uh, <laughs> your, uh, your, your, your phone, your phone is going to go. Zzz, zzz, zzz. <laughs> yeah, your phone explodes pretty yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was kind of curious. I mean, what, what's behind it? How, how does being on Explore actually be, help me? And of course, I mean, with the amount of photos that get uploaded to something like Flickr every day, you can't have people pick photos there must oh. be some sort of an algorithm there that oh. does that picking for them and the question is now what does that algorithm do now of course i do not have any first hand knowledge because if i had i could I'd, I'd be able to game the system and that's everyone's trying to find out what is that algorithm that gets you into this uh, prestigious gallery but there is a lot of research out there by users of Flickr, because of course everyone wants to wants that right so the, here are just a few assumptions, but I, I'm pretty sure we're not too far off here. Um, what definitely goes into a decision of putting a picture on Explore, which, by the way, is only there for like one day, I think, and then it scrolls wow. away and the, the storm ebbs down. Um, the thing that is important is views, like how, how often was the picture seen? Uh, how many favs did it, or f favorites oh, did it get yeah, in, in a yeah. short time? And the engagement in terms of comments. I have so, one picture I just was checking in Explore, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, pictures of all time. 
uh, that oh, I yeah. took. Yeah. And it did get an explore. And you're right. It kind of explodes when it gets an explore. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. So there are also a few parameters that are quite obvious. One is like it has to have a minimum size. So if your photo is only 800 pixels in size, it doesn't have a chance to get there because they want to present something that looks good. A bit of a more controversial thing is that uh, when Flickr recently was bought by Smugmark, they announced that pro members, as in paying members, are more likely to get on uh, Explore. Well, we ought to get so, something for our money, yeah. <laughs> sure. And and then there are a few things that are thought of influencing that algorithm too, and that is your activity, uh, as in how active are you on Flickr? If you are more active, apparently you get uh, rewarded okay. by having a higher okay. chance of getting your photos right. okay. and explore um, a negative correlation th there's a negative correlation with if if your photo is in many groups like you can also have your photo in different groups inside Flickr and so your photo gets showcased in more places but that apparently reduces your chances to get on explore uh, what uh, most photos on explore also don't have is like visible photo frames or watermarks. Oh, okay, so, so don't don't watermark them. Well, I, the one the, the one I just I just had explode actually has a watermark. So uh, again, this is there's no hard and I, fast rule, I guess. And and I would also think that they have those rules on a bit of a sliding scale to make it harder to figure out what the algorithm works like. Um, also, one thing that's um, been reported on is that if you get a picture on Explore, you are internally kind of blocked from Explore for, I think, about nine to ten days. Oh, yeah. That so makes sense because you, you don't want one person dominating, right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it, I think in the past that has actually happened. Yeah, because there but are photographers that will – like my friend Thomas Hawk will just always right. be on Explore if they would right. let him. <laughs> now, interesting uh, side fact here is that – Apparently, the actual quality of your photo has nothing to do with yeah, I you see, getting honestly, explore. Yeah, because I see some it, photos that aren't that great up here. It and and I let me quote a user who like five six years ago a years ago he posted that on one of the Flickr internal forums. Uh, I think his name is Ian Sand. Um, he wrote, "Don't get too fuzzed about explore. It is an arcane calculation of community involvement." and has little to do with the merits of the photo. People who do obsess about it do so at the cost of a slice of their sanity, so be careful. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I just enough. in general, <laughs> I, I think it's nice to be on there. It's definitely a, a nice uh, a, a nice thing for your ego. It, it'll definitely feel good if you get a lot of attention. But... I, I had pictures on Explore maybe five, six times a year in the past. Wow. And pretty good. And it's yeah, but it doesn't it didn't really it doesn't do pay the much. bills. Yeah. It doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> it didn't get me any jobs. It it's mostly something that I can feel good about. But it's nice. That's pretty and this much, is yeah. so the reason I'm on both Flug, Smug Mug and Flickr, Smug Mug is a gallery that isn't really about social. Uh, it's a place where I put my best photos. You can buy photos, you can get placemats or whatever made out of them. Flickr is about social. It's about people commenting, faving, reviewing. And so right. for me, it's like Instagram. It's a place where I want to put my photos for public uh, view and comment. And that's why I use both. And I'm very happy to be paid members of, uh, of both. By the way, and we I have... And I believe a Explore, Explore um, rewards being active in the community. And I think that's a good thing. Oh, absolutely. We do have a photo assignment. Uh, you can submit your picture from an ant's perspective to our tech guy group on Flickr and a couple more weeks to submit. I still have to take a picture. I got to get on my hands and knees. Chris Marquardt, he's at discoverthetopfloor.com and he's our regular photo guy. Helps us out with uh, our photography. Good luck on getting an explore. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. I never really even thought about it. I, I didn't even know that I had a picture in Explore, so I don't expect that to ever happen. Particularly. Well, again, it's it's engagement. So if you if you're active in the community, uh, if you if you interact with other members of the community, and uh, then then the chances apparently are higher. So yeah, yeah. 
And you, and but it's you, good. I mean, it, it, it furthers involvement. It furthers oh, the that's community. The whole point. And that's, that's what Flickr is all about. I agree. And one of the reasons they do it is so you can go to Flickr and, uh, and, and see great images right away. You just go to the Explore tab and you'll see some fun, exciting, interesting images right away. Is Flickr your favorite photo group these days, photo site? Well, I have a private one, my own, on my own domain, which I feed occasionally. Um, I put pictures on Flickr. Flickr is one of many. It has. It doesn't have the same, uh, let's say, the same weight as it used to yeah. like 10 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, it was the yeah. place, wasn't it? I, I, it could it could be it could come back but facebook is very strong instagram is very strong when it comes to photos i don't want to have anything to do with instagram i really don't and I, the influencer thing you. that's going on trey ratcliffe just wrote a very damning book about influencers uh <laughs> and uh you know and he's funny because he's an influencer and he's taken advantage of these platforms to great effect but um i kind of agree with him it's uh it's a negative a negative um, uh, space, and I and I far prefer to be somewhere where uh, where it's about photography and not about you know selling tea <laughs> and things yep. like that. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. I I don't miss uh, Instagram, but I you know on the other hand I don't use Flickr as much as I, I used to use Instagram. I really ought to st start doing that. Yeah, they, they need this opportunity. They could create a single feed thing like instagram and do very well i think that's what they need to do i'm sure smug mug's considering that uh hope so i have I a Flickr so. app on my phone and it automatically uploads everything to Flickr. but uh, oh another another interesting fact about those um about that photo is that 98 percent of the engagement came through the mobile app ah uh, 98 percent so people are using the mobile app primarily. Interesting. That's apparently what they do, yes. Very interesting. So it has to be sort of mobile compatible. Good to know. Leo James in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Hello, James. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. Um, I have two questions for you. Yes, sir. So uh, I was gifted a Lenovo Idea Center Model K410. Very nice. It came with... Yeah, it's, it's all right. I mean, especially for free, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So it came without a hard drive. So I put a hard drive uh, from a laptop in it. Okay. Um, that, bro that broke on me two years ago, and it still had the operating system in it. Nice. Uh, Windows, yeah, nice. Windows 10. So uh, everything it, is work. It booted up. Yeah. I, I mean, I played around a little bit with it. I had to uh, reset the BIOS. But... Um, so it's working now, but I'm getting this uh, warning message that my Windows 10 Pro isn't registered. So um, Yes, that's said, right, because it isn't. It's registered to that laptop. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so basically my question is, uh, can I just leave this like it is, or am I going to run into some kind of uh, problem? You'll be able to use it for a while. Okay. If you can put up with the pop-ups. But after a period of time, somewhere between 30 and 90 days, it will start doing less and less. Okay. So eventually it's going to be unusable. All right. So, so the good news is it's not expensive to, I think it's 90 bucks to pay for a license for it. Oh, okay. So that mean I go and look and buy a key, basically? Yeah, don't do it from I... eBay or anywhere like that. You can actually do it within that version of Windows. When it pops up and says this isn't licensed, it'll it should give you a little pop up that says buy a license. Okay, yeah, I, I saw that. So yeah. buy directly from Yeah, Microsoft. absolutely. Do not get it from eBay or somewhere like that. That's a real problem. That's a gray market for Windows license uh, keys. Be and a lot of times they're not good. So uh, sometimes it comes from uh, devices sold uh, uh, as, uh, you know, complete with Windows, you know, computers sold as complete with Windows, but the seller keeps the license key and then sells it again 20 more times, but it can only be used once. Things like that. So I would, uh, I would really just get it from Microsoft and pay the, whatever Microsoft uh, wants you to pay. Now, you said Pro. If it's Windows 10 Pro, that's more expensive. You don't need Pro. Get Windows 10 Home, and that's I think uh, 90 bucks, 140 bucks for Windows 10 Pro. Yeah, the reason that is is what Microsoft does uh, and did with your laptop that had licensed version of Windows is it 
uh, it put together um, a magic number based on the hardware in that laptop that identified that laptop fairly uniquely and associated that with the license key. So as soon as you take it out of that laptop on the hard drive and put it in another device, it goes out and it looks and says, well, wait a minute, this is a different motherboard, different network card, different everything. The only, the only thing that's the same is the hard drive. This is not the same computer. You don't have a license for this computer. Um, if you have Windows 10 Pro, the chat room saying, and they may, I think they might be right, you probably can't buy Windows 10 Home. You'll have to buy Pro or do a full reinstall. Buy it and do a full reinstall of Windows 10. Good idea for everybody. Second time this has come up today. To have uh, just dedicated, it needs to be an 8 gigabyte USB key, but those are everywhere. They come in cereal boxes. You probably have one, you know, holding your door open. Just find an 8 gigabyte USB key and download the Windows 10 media creation tool and put the installer on a USB key. It's good for everybody to have one. Yeah, sure, most computers, including that Lenovo Idea Center, will have a secret partition, a hidden partition with the Windows 10 installer on it. But what if the hard drive fails or whatever? It's always a good idea to have that. And honestly, you might want to do a reinstall anyway on that Idea Center because it has all the drivers and stuff that was installed on the laptop. That's not the same as the drivers you need for the Idea Center. It sounds like it's operating fine. That's the theory. The Windows will then say, oh, you need a different driver for your video card and download those all. But it's been my experience. Sometimes things operate less than optimally. So it's not a bad idea. Reformat the whole hard drive. Start over. And, uh, and and make sure you have just the stuff that you need for that idea center on there. 8888 Ask Leo, website techguylabs.com. Line three is Mike in Long Beach, California. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hey. How are you doing, Leo? I am well. How are you, Mike? I'm good. I have a question about uh, over-the-air DVRs and antennas. I'm thinking of hooking a setup up. I've been looking into it, and I cannot determine what is actually the top of the line or the best one that I can get. I'm a, I'm a TiVo fan, but TiVo is the priciest option because they charge you either a, a monthly fee for the TV guide or a lifetime license for the TV guide. But TiVo, TiVo does, you know, it's I have three TiVos in the house because I'm a glutton for punishment. But it is, in my opinion, the best DVR experience. But you have to buy the TiVo that's four over the air. So it's an OTA version of uh, TiVo. Uh, there are other companies that make over-the-air uh, uh, DVRs. Most of them, because most people nowadays receive television from cable and then satellite. Uh, there's a small number that still get over-the-air and want a DVR for the over-the-air. That's what all TiVos used to be, before, but but now most TiVos are cable or satellite. Uh, the other companies that make over-the-air DVRs that I'm aware of are Channel Master. They make a pretty nice OTA, and they don't charge for the... Uh, the, the TV guide, which is nice. And Silicon Dust makes something called the HD Home Run. So those are the two other DVRs. I'm a fan of TiVo if, if for only one thing, and somebody in the chat room mentioned it, TiVo Ad Skip. A lot of the stuff you, you TiVo, if, when, I, when I, I like to watch Jeopardy. And uh, I do it when I'm walking, working out, and I don't want to work out a minute more than I have to. So I can press the D button. Uh, it'll, you know, when it comes to a commercial and in Jeopardy, it goes, ding, press the D button, it skips the commercial. Now, don't ever do that with this show, okay? Don't, no. But Jeopardy, okay, fine. <laughs> you see, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a total hypocrite. But I do like that uh, <laughs> Skip that button. In fact, pretend I never even mentioned that. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. TechGuyLabs.com. Mike in Grenada Hills, California. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Hi, Mike. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I am well. How are you? Good, good. We're in sunny California. It's finally sunny out. Still raining up here in the north, but uh, yes, sunshine is coming. Oh, man. Yeah, it's nice to have a little heat. So here's my uh, question for you and wondering. I had a uh, Yamaha 475 receiver, and recently the circuit protection uh, component went out. And I've had it for about five years, 
And, uh, I, you know, it was kind of weird because I was getting ready to get a, a center speaker for it because I could never hear the dialogue when I'd be listening. Yeah, it's nice to I, have that center channel. You can boost it a little bit. Uh, I, right. Yeah, so, I use that all the time. So strange situation is that I, you know, I, it broke and I can't use it. So I got my old Luxman. I think it's from like 1994. <laughs> and I uh, connected it to Luxman 341. Yeah. And... Yeah. The sound difference was so spectacular. I was like, what the hell's going on? You mean it sounded better? It sounded much better. Wow. Wow. Now, reasons why I, I was kind of looking on the Internet saying that uh, the amplifier systems from now, from back then to now, have changed so much that uh, they're not really focusing on the sound component as much as just all the elements of, having a full theater sound system. That, that may be the case. They've gotten a lot cheaper. Now, that Luxman is, is still digital. It's not a, not tubes. You know, it's not so old that it's tubes. And, of course, there are a lot of right. aficionados of tube amps who say, oh, no, the sound is much better. It's still digital. It's still solid-state circuitry. It's not even that old. It's, what, 19, early 90s, right? Uh, right. But... I'm not kind of not surprised to hear that. The Yamahas are highly regarded. Uh, we've recommended them. Um, there are a couple of different components that could make a difference. One, of course, is the digital to analog converter. Because right. uh, ultimately, once you go to the speaker wire, you've got to have an analog signal. Those speakers can't understand bits. So there is a converter in there. And it, it, the choice of the DAC can make a big difference in the sound. And I think you're right. Amplifiers, the things that amplify the audio uh, level, uh, there's a there are big differences. Now, the problem is it's hard to objectively measure that. You can look at a you know a, a sound wave and say, well, it's getting more of the original sound or less of the original sound. But honestly, when it comes to <laughs> your ears, it's personal. It's very, very subjective. Um, right, right. So, so the fact that you prefer the Luxman, it could be that the Luxman is objectively better. It could be that you spent many years listening to the Luxman and you just like how it sounds. It could be it's better tuned for there's some. There's a lot of variables. I guess is all I'm saying. A lot of, a lot of variables in there, and yeah. you know the issue is now is I'm probably going to keep the Luxman. I just doesn't have a remote. Is there any way to get a universal remote for that? <laughs> uh, it has no remote at all. No, I, I got it from my dad. This is uh, handy down from my dad. So yeah, so it's not wasn't unusual in those days because people, what are you gonna you gonna sit in your couch and fiddle with the remote? All you're doing is listening to a record. <laughs> you still got to get up and flip right. it over. What are you gonna do? So if it doesn't have any remote, no universal remote will work because the way universal remotes work is emulating the actual remote. There's no remote right. to emulate. Oh, I'm not sure if it does or not. I mean, I guess I should look for like a little... Uh, look for it. You know. Actually, uh, I'm looking, if it's a Luxman, you said, I'm looking at R341. Right. It does have a remote. It does. Yeah. So uh, in okay. that case, good news. Yeah. You're going to look for a little black plastic square somewhere that's the receiver for the infrared signal. It'll be on the front, right. obviously. Uh, but, yeah, according to the specs that I'm looking at, at HiFiEngine.com, uh, there is a remote control available for that Luxman. That's good news because then, uh, so when you go out and get a universal remote, there's two ways you can program universal remotes. The cheaper ones, you take the old remote and you aim it at the new remote and you get them to talk to each other. That's not what you want since you don't have the old remote. But the right. folks who make the Harmony remotes, which are really, really good, have done something different. Uh, they have a database of all the programming codes used by as many possible pieces of gear as possible. And they've done that over the years because users have uploaded them. You know, if somebody had something that they didn't have in the database, he would then do the old-fashioned head-to-head programming, and that data would get communicated back to Harmony. And now Harmony has that. You don't have to do it anymore. So I would go and see. I would go to the Harmony uh, the site. It's owned by Logitech. Uh, myharmony.com and and they have a list of compatible products and okay. and cross your fingers that that Luxman is in there uh, if it is then you don't then just get a Harmony there's a lot of different Harmony um, uh, uh, remotes universal remotes there's a whole variety 
Uh, I'm searching for Luxman right now on the on the site. I guess I need the model number. So, um, what did you say it was? It was it's a R three forty one. Yeah, that's right. So let me see. Yeah, as a matter of fact, all Harmony products can control this device. Okay. So now you go out and get a Harmony Universal Remote. There's all different kinds. I like the Harmony Hub, which is if you want to control your whole home theater, the Hub is a $99 little puck that sends it's a it's like a giant universal infrared resender. So it sends it in all directions, and then you control it with your phone, your your tablet, or with the uh, uh, optional Harmony remote. You can even control it with Amazon's Echo, and uh, and you set it up on your computer. You go to the uh, Harmony website, you tell it everything and what you want to do, and it'll do all do it automatically. Uh, that's a yeah, pretty. I have uh, I have Roku, I have the Yamaha, yeah, you know, surround sound. Yeah, so it can all be controlled. You can actually say, you know, uh, hey Echo, uh, play uh, Jeopardy. And it will, you know, turn it to the right channel. It'll turn the right boxes on. It'll set the audio, everything. So that's wow. one to look at. That's the Harmony Hub. But then they have the Harmony One and the Harmony Touch, which are universal remotes. So some of it is just right. how much you want to spend. The Hub is cheap, but requires digital uh, interference, you know, digital working with it. So. Right, right. Now, just, uh, just wondering, are there any uh, receivers in today's, that are comparable and oh yeah to oh yeah the there's that sure aren't, that aren't like thousands of dollars ah oh yeah you didn't mention oh yeah that um <laughs> oh yeah of course how much do you have to spend again yeah. it's hard for me yeah. to say because this is why there there are still stereo magazines and stereo websites because it is very objective i mean subjective it's very much personal choice but you can right. get objective measurements and try to find something and often what i'll end up doing is just relying on reviewers that i trust who say yeah this one sounds really good but absolutely uh you know the yamahas and a lot of their ilk these consumer level uh receivers there are a few hundred dollars and so uh, yeah maybe they're not going to sound as good they're not going to spend a good dac alone could be a thousand dollars just the dac so, yeah, right. there's definitely going to be tied to the price. If you want better sound, I would just use the Luxman. You got the Luxman. The thing the Luxman won't do is Dolby decoding and things like that. So uh, if you have, for instance, a 4K TV with Dolby uh, or Atmos, you got to get a new receiver that supports all those standards or you won't be able to watch 4K television on it. Uh, I don't have a particular recommendation, to be honest. Uh, you can go to AVS Forum. Our friend Scott Wilkinson's a former site. They have lots of great reviews there. Uh, there's a lot of hi-fi review magazines and hi-fi review sites. Uh, I spend a lot, way too much time, to be honest, looking at all these sites. And I'm, in, ultimately, I've been caught in a place where I just can't pull the trigger because I can't. Get, there's no. There's very little universal acknowledgement. This is the best. This is the one. And it, and it really does depend on a lot of factors, including how much you want to spend. So I don't have a strict recommendation for the best uh, AV receiver. I use, uh, I tend to use Denon, but what's happened is that they've all been acquired. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't even know who owns Denon anymore. It's probably Samsung. I don't even, <laughs> I don't even remember. But they've all been acquired up, and and of course, what happens in that process is this kind of. Sadly, uh, this kind of uh, mushing together of, of uh, specs used to be a much more vital industry, I'm afraid. But now, uh, because kids today listen to music on Apple, those little white Apple earbuds that sound horrific, and they think this sounds great. And so there's, you know, there's no market for audiophile stuff. DNM is uh, is the Denon parent company, but who owns DNM? I can't even remember. <laughs> I can't even remember. Hey, thank you for the call and that trip down memory lane. Do love the Harmony remotes, though. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Steam rolling through the show. <laughs> 88, 88, ask Leo. Laura, Dana Point. Hi, Laura, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Leo? Thank you so much for taking my call. Are you on your Peloton bike right now? No, I'm not on my Peloton bike right now. <laughs> driving over to babysit my granddaughter and my grand cat named Leo. <laughs> oh, you have a grand cat named Leo? I do. Aw. I love my Peloton. Peloton is a internet-connected 
uh, spin cycle that you take classes out of their headquarters in New York City with their great, I think, wonderful Peloton trainers. They're fabulous. I love my bike. I've had it for about a month now. And my question is, there is all kinds of buzz in the Peloton community that there is a lawsuit yes. by some big companies against Peloton for not having the proper type of license for the music that they use for the spin classes. Right. And so if you've ever been to a gym and gone to a spin class, what do they play? Music. <laughs> they play music. <laughs> and they play popular music. And so Peloton does the same thing. The difference is they're streaming it over the Internet. So the classes are all over the country. And there are, of course, many more people attending. A couple of days ago, the National Music Publishers Association sued them for $150 million in damages, saying... They didn't have the, you nailed it, the right kind of license. Yes. So Peloton says, no, no, we bought licenses. It's not like they haven't. They say Peloton says we've partnered with each of the major music publishers. Uh, we're paying them license fees. But what the NMPA says is, yeah, you're paying us licenses, but not for something called synchronization licenses, which give a music user permission to release the song in video format. Oh, my God. So this is, I wouldn't take this too seriously. This is merely a process, part of a negotiation for more money uh, because of the way Peloton's doing it. Peloton thought, well, we're paying the license fees that any spin class would pay. But uh, they, they decided, and I'm sure they used lawyers and decided, well, we, we don't have to pay these sync fees. That's, that's no. Now, Peloton has four billion dollars, and I'm sure that has something to do with <laughs> with the lawsuit. Uh, you know, uh, I don't. I don't know if artists themselves are motivating this. I doubt it very much. It's almost certainly the music publishers themselves. Peloton says uh, we have great respect for songwriters and artists. We partnered with each of the major music publishers, record labels, and performing right organizations, and many independents. We've invested heavily to build in a best in breed reporting and licensing system. So they, they they've they've done everything you'd expect them to do. We pay, for instance, when you hear music, we just played a Peter Gabriel song. We report it to a, a, a organization called ASCAP BMI. And we pay a fee to ASCAP BMI, the radio network does, and ASCAP pays a fee to the, whoever owns the rights to that song, which may be Peter Gabriel and may not be. But whoever okay. owns the publishing rights to that song gets you know, a penny or two or whatever. I don't know what it is. We are a network, so we pay more than a single station does. There's a, it's a complicated thing. I wouldn't worry about it too much. I don't think it's going to hurt Peloton. It, it'll be a negotiation, which they'll eventually... Resolve. They'll just settle it. That's what everybody on the Facebook Peloton group seems to think. I, I love it. my Peloton because I like spin classes. Now, have you tried any of the other stuff? Because they're adding more exercise all the time. They've just added a treadmill. Yes, they've got the Peloton tread that looks really interesting yeah. also. It looks like it's got an iMac. It's got such a big screen in front of it. It looks like an iMac on that thing. Um, I am a big fan because I can get up in the morning and not have to get dressed to go to the gym. I can take a really high quality class of any length because they have short ones and long ones and any musical right. style with any variety of trainers. And uh, I just feel like it's a it's a great workout. I'm very happy with my Peloton. It's not cheap. Oh, I, no, it's not cheap. I love mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So don't worry. Peloton's not going anywhere. Uh, they'll, they'll resolve. This is... You know, I have been involved in lawsuits uh, like this, and it's always really just a negotiation. Nobody ever expects to go to court. It's just a way okay. of getting the other side to sit down at a table and say, well, what would be fair? Okay. So don't well, worry. Good to hear. They're we not going to start playing. They're not going to start playing nondescript, <laughs> you know, music <laughs> from, uh, from, you know, they're going to keep playing the good stuff, I'm sure. Oh, good. Because I heard that some of the um, people on the group that I'm on on Facebook said that um, they took down some of their classes that they had in, you know how you could take the classes either live or yeah. in, if it's in the library, and that they'd taken down some of the classes from the library. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, 
That might be just a defensive move short term. I'm sure they'll settle this. Okay. I think we hear the word lawsuit, and it sounds like a more contentious thing than it really is. A lawsuit merely means, look, we've got a dispute over what you should pay. Let's go see what the judge says. It's a way of resolving these these disputes if you can't sit down at a bargaining table without a judge. I think it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Don't well, worry. That's good to hear. Don't worry. Hey, are you are you willing to share your leaderboard name, Leo? Yeah. I, th uh, I think it's Chief Twit. I think it's Chief. Twit? What's yours? Mine is Thinner G Synergy. I'll find you. <laughs> I'd love to be your. It's friend. fun, isn't it? To have, you have the you have the friends and the. And then you can uh, you can you're gonna beat me the, the pants off me. I always I always try to choose the people in my age group because then, <laughs> then I can compete a little bit better. So do I. The old I don't you, by my age and sex. Yeah, I go by yeah exactly. I, I'll take the sixty plus folks, please, and then I can then I can compete. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much for your insight. I'll look for you, Spinner G. Spinergy Synergy. Spinergy Synergy. I'm pretty sure it's Chief Twit, C-H-I-E-F-T-W-I-T. -E I'll have to look. Okay. But look well, for Chief I'll, Twit, I'll and it's in Petaluma. It's in Petaluma, California. If you find Chief Twit in okay. Petaluma, that's me for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. Have yeah. a wonderful day. It's Peloton is one of, I think there's going to be a lot of these uh, new fitness devices uh, that use the Internet. I think it's probably the most successful right now, but there's a new one that's just coming out that's a, a big screen on the wall. It looks like a mirror. It's kind of a half mirror, half screen that you stand in front of and it gives you workouts and you're looking at yourself, but you're all, also looking at the workout. There's a, I'm seeing more and more of these. And there's a couple of things uh, prompting it. One, of course, is our uh, desire nationwide to get back in shape after becoming the fattest nation in the history of mankind. <laughs> And also, I think the baby boomers, as we age, and I'm a baby boomer, have started to pay a little more attention to our health, and we've got disposable income, and, and, and the internet really makes it possible to bring, I think, top flight uh, exercise into your house. I mean, it started with Jane Fonda, right? And her videotapes, you put them in the VHS recorder, and you do the exercise. But the problem is, you get in the same routine every single time. These new ones, they stream over the internet. You get, uh, you know, you can watch classes live. That by itself is kind of cool. You'll see the other people in the Peloton class bouncing around. You see the instructor, and it's all live. I think that's really amazing. You really feel like you're part of it. Plus, because it's live, they have a leaderboard, and that's what. Uh, <laughs> As we were winding up, that's what Laura was saying. What's your what's your handle? Because you use a, just like you would in a chat room or on a forum, you use a handle. You don't use your real name, and that's on the leaderboard. And you can see how other people are doing, and you can compete against them. You can even compete against yourself because it'll show your previous best time. And so, uh, and and you have a choice of live classes or on demand classes. That really is a, it's a really fun thing to do. It's also really expensive. All of these are. You know, I mean, if you said. Look, just buy a bicycle and ride around. That's going to be a tenth the cost. And, you know, you're going to get your exercise. So it's hard to justify, to be honest. They're very expensive. But at the same I always tell, I tell myself, well, it's cheaper than getting ill, cheaper than a heart attack. So I justify it that way. It's fun. And, you know, I have to keep up on this stuff too, right? It's all high tech, high tech exercise. Jeff in uh, Westchester. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Can you hear me? I hear you great, Jeff. Thanks for calling. Uh, all right. So a couple of things. First of all, um, I know I just subscribed to Peloton Digital, so I'm going to try to use my own equipment. I haven't got it around. That's before. actually a good idea. It's a lot less expensive. The Peloton gear is very pricey. Um, right. And, and you just get the classes and ride your own bicycle. Sure. Why not? Right. I have a bicycle and I have a treadmill. So it's Perfect. Been, it's been like, yeah, a coat hanger for a while, but now I'm going to <laughs> the only The only real difference is that when you're using the Peloton equipment, it feeds the your your metrics, how fast you're going, how many watts you've used, and all of that stuff. Your heart rate, because it has a strap, feeds that back into the gear, and that's when you can compete because you can see how you're doing comparing to other people, yeah, also using that Peloton gear. But hey, whatever it takes, you know, the whole point is get moving, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So um, I took a recommendation. I'm talking about my aftershocks. I love them with the air, but the real reason I called, um, do they make a device, because we've got these people taking mail from us, that is a Wi-Fi 
mailbox alert because I have the old mail guard from Radio Shack that alerts me. Oh, yeah. A light that will light up that says, your mother has just written to you. You better pick up. <laughs> well, you can open up the door of the mailbox and it alerts you inside the house, but I know they, I have pretty good Wi-Fi coverage. Oh, so you want one for your physical mailbox, your rural route mailbox, and, and that if, if somebody opens the door, a light goes on. Right, correct. I have that in my house now, uh, but in a deep, and when I'm not home... So I was wondering if there's a Wi-Fi connected mailbox door. I think I that's a, a price or something like that. That's that's a good yeah. question. I bet you there is. I mean, that can't be too hard to do. And of course, you could easily. This would be a great uh, project for uh, the handy electronics fella. Um, you need to. You could probably do it with a Raspberry Pi. You need to put a switch that uh, that notices that the door is open, which usually means that when the door is closed, there's a contact made. When it's been broken, then it's kind of the opposite of a normal switch. You, you get a notification via Wi-Fi. I don't know off the top of my head if there is one. Wait a minute. Scooter X does. He's our chat mod. Scooter is the fastest guy on Google I have ever seen. He says, on Amazon, there's something called the Mail Chime. $45. The Mail... Oh, look at this. Is I think it's exactly what you're looking for. A small sensor... Placed on the mailbox door, when a mail person or anyone else opens the door, the sensor sends a wireless signal, probably not Wi-Fi, but just a wireless signal, to a receiver in the home. The receiver will beep four times and light up a bright LED. What a great idea. So, uh, mail chime. It's got a little thing that goes in the mailbox and a receiving unit that you go inside the house. Well done, Scooter X. <laughs> Nim the nimble Googling fingers of Scooter X in our chat room. Mail chime. Thanks for the call. Gene, Rochester, New York. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Gene. Hey, hi, Leo. Question for you, if I could. Yes. Uh, basically, the I'm looking for an iPad, and I noticed the Pro has the liquid retina display. Uh, as opposed to, say, the new one, which just came out uh, last Monday, which is the iPad Air. Yeah. Apple has Apple's, just the retina display. Apple's done a great job of confusing the heck out of everything. And these are just <laughs> these are just marketing terms, I have to tell you. The the new iPad Airs are, are quite good. Um, the screen supports something I think that's fairly important called True Tone, which means it adjusts the color of the screen for the ambient lighting. And I think the, the color gamut and everything, these are very, very good screens on that new iPad. The bigger difference, besides price, is that this iPad Air has uh, the old-style design. So it has a fingerprint reader, touch ID, and a home button. It's got a, a headphone jack, and it has larger bezels. That's the bigger difference than the quality of the screen. I think the quality of the screen on the, iP the new iPad Air and even the iPad Mini is very good. And what they've done with these, even though they didn't change the outside at all, they changed the guts. They have the uh, A12 Bionic chip in them, which is the same chip in the uh, iPhone XS. Very fast chip So they and the much faster graphics processor and all of that. So I don't think that the, yeah, liquid retina, that's a marketing term. What does that mean? Is there any reason to justify paying more money? Yeah. If you really want to see, like, nature, you know, well, pictures and very... No, no, not if, not if it's just the quality of the image, I wouldn't say so. I would say that the new iPad Pros have a lot of other advantages. The smaller bezels mean you get a bigger screen on the same size device. Uh, the screens might be marginally better quality. I don't think they're going to be hugely different. Uh, and they use different pencils. The new iPad Airs use the old pencil... The new iPad Pros use the new pencil. They're not compatible. Uh, I think the new pencil has some nice features, chiefly that it charges uh, on top of the iPad with a little magnetic attachment rather than having to take uh, the end off and plugging in into the lightning port, which is goofy. Uh, wow. And there, I think the number of pressure points, I think there's some other improvements in the new pencil. But if you're not going to use the pencil and you want to save... I think quite a bit of money. I can't, I don't, I'm not sure what the difference is. The iPad Air starts at $500. I think that's 200 bucks less than the same size iPad Pro. That's a pretty... I think it is, yeah. yeah. And of course, the, the newest iPad Pro is the 11-inch, which is, they did exactly what you described. Yeah, it's the same size it's thing. It's a little home button out and yeah. spread the screen. Yeah. 
I have the 12.9 inch uh, new iPad Pro. Uh, I think it is a computer from the future. And the reason I say that is because it's still running the old iOS from the past. This may all change, though, this fall when iOS 13 comes out. Apparently, we'll give it a lot more uh, advanced features. It needs it. It needs it. The computer right now and the new iPad Pros is way overpowered for what they can do. Get the iPad Air. Save the money. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So look at this is the... Um, this is the S10 Plus. So there's a little bar there, right? Let me unlock it. But it disappears. That's the Samsung Pay bar. So now I don't have any Android controls there at all. You still have, you know, the, the pull punch. But I love it that that screen pretty much occupies the whole, or the picture pretty much occupies the whole screen without anything. And you just know that if you swipe up, that's home. You swipe the right side, that's recents. You swipe the left side, that's back. You just know that. And so you don't need to... There's also a little thing which you can turn off. I can't see it right now, but the Samsung Edge screen is right there. So what I love about this is it's a clean display, but I actually have, because I know what the gestures are, and I because I pretty much set it up that way. Uh, so you have complete choice, and I use Action Launcher. So I have additional, like this is all the apps, Action, action Launcher lets me put the apps there. I have a little sliding door that is my audio stuff, so I can get to that very quickly. Um, these look like single icons, but in fact, they're not. So like the Google Maps, if I tap that, that'll be Google Maps. Let's swipe up to go home. But if I swipe down a little bit on it, it's actually all of my travel apps and navigation apps in a folder. So it's a folder that is that, that if you tap on it, will launch the topmost thing in the folder. But if you swipe down on it, we'll show you all the other things in that folder. I, that's completely a configuration of Action Launcher. But I do that way so that everything is right here on the front page. And these are these are all just these are all just um, widgets, big big old widgets for informational stuff like my calendar and to do list, and uh, that way everything I need is right here. But that's completely how I've set it up, right? If I use the Samsung launcher, it's much more limited. I this I like this, and man, I love how clean that screen is. So if I launch. Let's see, we just launched Play Store. I don't, there's nothing at the bottom, you know. But I know that this swiping up there is home. Also, I've remapped the Bixby button to be the Google Assistant, which is really nice. It's awesome being able to help. <laughs> so that, that gives me some real, instead of the bottom squeeze on the uh, Pixel phone i have the P bixby button to launch the assistant which is great well, this is this phone is oh, love it uh david in los angeles hello david leo laporte the tech guy hello leo um hey leo i don't know if you've heard about this or know about this i received something in the mail and it looks like it's legit from google and it wants me to participate in a community research study on how Americans use and consume media. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't, program? but I'm sure know? Google, like every company, does a lot of this kind of thing. The real th way to know if it's legit or not is the address, the Google, the, uh, the URL that they give you to click. I presume they say, if you want to participate, go to this website? Um, or, is it a, or is it actually a survey you fill out? It's it's Google.com opinion rewards yeah. and then they give me a, a a code. So that's the key, and this is uh, it is legit, and this is how you tell when you look at an address, a web address. Bad guys are so clever. So for instance, a bad guy might have an address that's Google.com's.badguy.com, and you just see the Google.com, the badguy.com might even be cut off in your browser, and you say, oh, that's Google. It's not. What you're looking for is the middle part, the thing.com, .net, .gov, whatever. The, the last, it's hard to describe because what you're really looking for is something called a TLD, which is the top level domain. And if that's google.com, 
then you're operating with the actual Google. No bad guy can simulate that. If that's Microsoft.com, then you're operating with Microsoft. But if it's Microsoft.hacker.com or Microsoft.com.hacker.com, that's not the real thing. So you, I guess you want to look for the last thing before the slash. That's a that's good. Okay. Yeah. Because um, you know, I'm by nature just suspicious of everything and... I was thinking that it could be even a government program because I use a VPN and I don't share my anything with anyone. Like you can't find. Well, if you're that, if you're, name. if you want to be that private, throw it out. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not gonna <laughs> but if you see something that's Google.com slash, that slash yeah. tells you that last bit is the TLD, the top level domain, and if the TLD is Google.com, they can't fake that. They can, as I said, have google.badguy.com. They can even, because if they control badguy.com, they can have anything before the dot if they want. They can even have google.com.badguy.com. So you really have to look for the slash, if there is one, or the last thing, the very last thing. That's the TLD. And if it comes from the company that says it comes from, then it's legit. It's, it's tough. Can I ask you one quick question about that same issue? Because I've seen this before. How about the, the addresses where they split the word in half, like it would be G-O-O -O dot G-L-E? So that's a little tricky because Google does have a URL shortener, which is G-O-O -O dot G-L. That's legit. That's the one. Yeah, it's a domain name shortener. And that really, I don't like, this is a problem. This uh, These short uh, URL shorteners are a problem because they do obscure the actual domain. And that's problematic because you have really, it's difficult for normal users to figure out, well, where is this going? And so if you uh, post something on Twitter, for instance, Twitter will replace it with their domain shortener. Um, you'll see this in a lot of places. And the problem with the domain shortener is unless you know that Google is goo.gl, you don't know where that's going to take you. So what you could do is click on that link and then see what you get. Better yet, if you're in a good browser, you can, if you hi, hover over a link like t.co, which is Twitter shortener, it should show you the full domain that it's pointing to. I don't like domain shorteners. I think this is a big mistake because it can obscure where you're actually going. And going to a bad website is bad. I mean, it's risky. There are websites, in fact, if we were talking earlier about pwn to own and the way that uh, the bad guys were able to get into these devices, and some of these devices, they all they had to do was get the device to go to a website of the, that they were in control with, control of, and they had the uh, exploit sitting behind the scenes on the website. If they can get you to a bad site, there's all sorts of things they can do. Now, Google is doing these surveys, I'm told, and because it does take you to a domain that's google.com slash, that's an official Google site, uh, you know it comes from Google. Now, whether you want to do it, that's another matter. Google's not famous for protecting your privacy. So uh, since you use VPNs, you might want to not do that survey. Hey, you know, I may not trust Google, but I do trust you, Leo. Thank you. I, tr I, I really you try every day to earn that, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you've you got very a very much. soothing voice. I always <laughs> thought you should do books on, you know. That's my goal. When I retire, that's what I'm going to do is read books. They, Audible has asked me in the past to do a book, and I just it's a, it's a lot of work, and I don't have the time. But if I ever retire, uh, I'll be reading books. I'll be reading books that put I you to you sleep. Thank you so much, Leo. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Uh, great question. And it really applies to more than just something you might get in the mail. It applies to any, any link that you see. Be very careful about clicking links in emails, in messages. Often they lead you to malicious sites. And sometimes the mere act of going to the site will infect you. That's why we always say a couple of things. One is keep your system and anything that you use on it up to date. Because when these flaws are discovered, the companies will patch them. An unpatched system is very dangerous to use. So make sure you're always installing those critical security patches. And then be very judicious about the links you click. If, if you don't trust or you don't know where it came from, I, I think the best thing to do would be not click on it. And if you're really worried, maybe you get an email from your bank that says, quick log into the bank to make sure that this is not a fraudulent charge we just got. Don't click that link. Type it in. Type it in. Go to your bank manually. 
You know, if you get a link from Bank of America saying, oh, we're worried there's some weird transactions, don't just click that link. That's not going to be Bank of America. And you can, you'll even look at the URL. You'll know if you, if you know what to look for. But rather than clicking on that link, type in bankofamerica.com and log into your account and do it that way. Then, then you'll see. Oh, yeah, that was I was being fished. Last call of the day, Larry in Manitoba. Hi, Larry. Are you there? Yeah. Hi, Leo. Welcome. What can I do for you? I've got a question. I've got a Windows 7 uh, laptop. Um, if I disable the uh, WMIPRVSE.exe process, that's the Windows Management Instrumentation. Yeah. And if I disable the Windows Management Instrumentation service, the laptop uses a lot less uh, processor power and the fans don't run as much. Is it safe to disable that? That's a good question. I mean, something that's running in the background. Is this your personal uh, laptop or is it a corporate laptop? No, it's personal. <clears throat> it's a uh, Toshiba laptop. I'm just trying to see what this uh, WMI does and whether you can live without it. I would say yes, you can disable it. It doesn't seem to do any pro hurt anything when I disable it. It yeah. lowers the... Uh, a lot of the processing, though, it goes down from about fifty or sixty percent down to four or five percent. To my and my understanding is that it is so, it is a process that runs that other applications can query and say, "Oh, how much RAM is left, or how much hard drive is left," uh, and so that's going to be of value to some applications. I'd say try disabling it. See if it see if it makes some applications not work properly. Uh, if it doesn't, if there's no reason to disable it, don't. But since you say it'll save a lot of power, go ahead. Out of time. Man, it goes fast. I'll be back next weekend. I hope you will, too. We'll talk about the Big Apple announcement. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.